Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. And on this episode of Jill on Money, how to have those tough conversations with your parents about their money. I am not going to jeopardize my own retirement and my own future to support my adult children. If I am helping them, they're going to have to jeopardize their finances to support me as I get older. And I don't want to do that to them. I do not want to be a burden to my kids. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. You know, so much of what we talk about on this podcast has to do with talking to your spouse or talking to your kids. It's now time to talk to your parents. And I know this can be hard. And that's why we have a great guest. Cameron Huddleston has just written an important book. It's called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk. How to Have Essential Conversations with Your Parents About Their Finances. So here's our interview with Cameron Huddleston. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. We're going to get to your book in a second. It's called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk. Fantastic. I love it. Love the topic. It's great. Uh, I want to start with the big question that we ask to begin our podcast, and that is, what is the best either financial or career decision that you've ever made? They're combined, actually. Oh, brilliant. Yes. So the best career decision I made was becoming a personal finance journalist because it has helped me with my everyday finances. Although sometimes I meet with personal financial columnist journalists and they're not so great with their own stuff, but they are good at giving advice. <laughs> <laughs> I try to practice what I preach. I'm not perfect. I don't think anyone is, but I really do try to practice what I preach. Okay. So your new book, Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk, How to Have Essential Conversations with Your Parents About Their Finances is out. And you start the book with one of my favorite surveys from care.com. More than half of parents would rather have the sex talk with their kids than talk to their parents about money and aging issues. Why do you think that is? Well, we know that both sex and money are taboo topics, but I think there are several reasons why adult children are so afraid to have these conversations. They're afraid their parents are going to think they're being nosy, Mm -hmm. they're being greedy, Mm -hmm. that it's none of their business, and that if they bring this topic up, It's going to make their parents mad and hurt their relationship. You come from a very personal story about your own mom. So would you mind sharing that with us? Sure. So when I moved back to Kentucky and my mom was about 60 years old, I mentioned to her that she should look into getting long-term care insurance. I didn't beat around the bush. I just came out and said it because she and my father were divorced. She was on her own. And I knew that if she had any long-term care needs in the future, that long-term care insurance would help cover those. Hold on. I got to I got to be nosy here. So how old were you when they got divorced? I was in college. Oh, so my parents got divorced. So she had been on her own for a while. Okay. And when she was divorced, did she talk about her money stuff at that time? Because you're older. So was there pressure? Was it all of a sudden like, oh, my God, my parents are getting divorced. I can't afford to go to college anymore because that happens to kids. Fortunately, they, my parents both, continued to help support me through college. It wasn't so much of an issue. My father was always, you don't talk about money. It okay. is it is impolite. You don't ever talk about money. My mother, it wasn't such a big deal with her. We mm. didn't talk about it openly, but she didn't act as if it was a taboo topic. Okay, so that's helpful. Yes, it was helpful. And I think maybe because I was a personal finance journalist when I moved back home, and I still am, she listened to my advice. And so she went to meet with an insurance agent. But unfortunately... She had a pre-existing health condition okay. that made her too much of a risk to qualify. Did you only find out about that because of the underwriting process? And we already knew about that. Okay. It was a it's a it's a benign tumor that was behind her left ear that had caused hearing loss. So if I had been smart, I would have taken that opportunity to start talking to her about her finances to say, "Mom, you don't qualify for long-term care insurance. Let's look at your finances, see where you stand, see what sort of care you could afford on your own, and let's talk about the care you would want. What are you thinking in that moment? Can you go back in time? Like, yeah, she didn't get it that too bad. She didn't get it too bad. She's young. She's relatively young, and I look back at that, and I see that I made a big mistake. It was a great opportunity to start talking to her, and then, of course, what would happen a few years later... I start noticing that she's having trouble remembering things. But then at that point, it's no longer a conversation about what if this happens, mom, but it's 
this is actually happening. And so I was afraid at that point to talk to her about her finances because it meant pointing out to her that we're having the conversation because I can see that she has memory problems. So then what happens? I mean, she's now showing some signs of something. You don't know what exactly what it is. Yes. It, start, it became obvious, though, that it was Cognitive. probably the early stages of dementia. And so young. She was so young. She was, she was, I would say at that point, maybe around 64. Wow. And it got to the point where I realized, okay, I can't stall. I cannot put this conversation off anymore. And so what I said to her was, let's go meet with an attorney and update your legal documents, your will, your living will, which is also called an advanced healthcare directive in some places and her power of attorney. I knew that she probably had not updated those since she gotten, she had gotten divorced from my father. And I knew that those documents were so important because you had to be mentally competent to sign them. And fortunately, she still was. Mm. She was still competent enough to sign those documents. you have siblings? I do. I have a younger sister. She lives far away from us. Mm-hmm. And so really, it was me. Okay. You get that buckled down. Yes. Now, what about the money? Meeting with the attorney was a really smart move for a couple reasons. First of all, we get everything squared away with her documents because if my mother had not named me power of attorney before her her Alzheimer's, which is what she was diagnosed with, really progressed, I would not have been able to step in and start managing her finances. And I don't think most people realize this. They think, you know, if something happens to mom and dad, they have a stroke, for example, they're in the hospital, they have to write checks from mom and dad's account to pay the bills. They can't do that. Right. Unless mom and dad have already named you power of attorney. You can't talk to the doctors about their health care unless they've named you their health care surrogate or power of attorney. And so people don't realize that without these documents, you're kind of stuck. You're kind of stuck. You're really stuck in the alternatives to go through the court system. Yeah. You and have spend thousands of dollars Terrible. a month. No, it's awful. Oh, God. It's awful. And so meeting with the attorney, she she pointed us in the right direction. She said, you need to go to your mother's bank and put me on the account as her representative payee. She walked us through some other steps to take. And then I slowly started stepping in because she was still doing relatively well, just having issues with short-term memory. You don't want to just go in and start taking over. Mm -hmm. And that is not at all what my book is about. It's not about talking to your parents so you can tell them what they're doing wrong or take over their finances. It's about having these conversations before things like my mom's situation arise. So you can talk about the hypotheticals. You can make sure the legal documents are there so that if you have to step in and help, you can. So if you want to start having these conversations, I thought that you had this really great section about how you approach this. And you write, it might seem like I'm wagging my finger at you here, but the goal is to get your parents talking. Here's what you shouldn't do. And you start with don't use you language. What does that mean? So that means the conversation is not about you. It's about your parents. And, you know, for any of your listeners who are in a relationship and, you know, when you get mad at your partner and then you come at them and you say, I hate it when you do this. And of course, they become defensive. And so if you're going to talk to your parents about this, you don't want to come to them and say, you need to do this. You're you're getting scammed. You're getting taken advantage of things. You want to come to them saying, I am concerned. I would like to know. It would give me peace of mind if we could have this conversation. It's about you, but you looking out for your parents. And you also say that obviously you don't want to appear to have selfish motives. I think most people know that. But I think another part, don't be condescending. That's hard. It is hard because even though you know these are your parents, if they are already older and you can see that maybe they haven't made some smart financial moves or you can see that they're getting taken advantage of by scammers, you feel like as the child, you want to come in and protect them. But the language you use might suggest that you're just trying to step in and take over. And you really have to be clear about when you want to have these conversations. And you note, and I think you even just said this, that you want to take advantage of an opportunity as it arises. So you don't want to wait till something cataclysmic has happened. So in your case, it might have been, okay, the underwriting shows you're not going to get long-term care. Let's use this opportunity. What are other good points to maybe use as the when to have a conversation moment? So I will certainly start by saying, 
don't do this at the holiday meal. Ever. Ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> don't say, please pass the turkey and let's talk about your will. Yeah, right. Because there are people there who don't need to be part of that conversation. So when maybe your parents have already retired and maybe they're complaining about how they're not getting to travel as much as they wanted to. So don't just write that off as, oh, that's too bad for mom and dad. They're not getting to do what they wanted to do in retirement. Why is that? Start asking questions. Oh, why not? And then you might find out, well, maybe they haven't saved enough. But you can use that as an opportunity to very politely kind of suggest, you know, I have some great ideas on ways you can save on travel. And then let that lead to other conversations. The thing is, you don't want to start bombarding them with questions all at once. When you find your way in, point out to them that you would like to talk about this more. And then ask them, can we find a time to sit down and do this? And it might take several conversations, but you don't really want to catch them out of the blue. You can use a moment to get the topic started, to get the conversation started, but don't suddenly start grilling them about their finances. I have noticed with my own mother, who will be turning 80 this year, that she will open the door in a way that if you want to walk through, you can go through. And it, what I think a lot of people find this, that she talks about friends of hers. Oh, you know, it's so horrible. Barbara has to now go from assisted living to like actual real nursing care. Then I say, what would you want if that happened to you? Would you want us to have like 24-7 care in your apartment? Would you want to be in a facility? How do you think about that? I have to tell you something. My mother, who's incredibly social, she'll like play bridge. Anywhere there's a bridge. I would always think... If she could be in a facility where she could play bridge, you know, 24 hours a day and just be able to always get a game that she would choose that. And I was surprised when she said, I don't think I'd want to be in a facility. I don't like eating with people. Like, I don't want like mandatory. You have to eat with these people. I said, but what about the whole bridge thing? She's like, well, I guess I'd want to be able to have people to come to my place and still play bridge. But like, I don't know if I'd really want that. And that was surprising to me. Because I really think of her, I mean, on one hand, she's incredibly social, but I guess what she is raising is I'm also very private, and that's important to me. So it was just interesting because it was someone else, and we could talk about it that way. And stories are such a good way to start these conversations. So your mom had a story about her friend, which obviously led you to asking questions, but you might have stories you can share about your own friends, friends who had a parent who died without a will. And it led to all this family fighting over who got what or a friend who had to stop working to care for a parent or maybe even a friend who had conversations or the parents are really open and kept them updated on their finances. And you can say, you know, my friend, Barbara, her mother been so good about giving her all this information about where her estate planning documents are and information about the passwords for her account so that if something happens to her, she can step in and help. And I just, I love this mom because it's made things so easy for Barbara. Maybe we can do something like that. This is Jill on Money. Hi, I'm Jill Schlesinger, certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, and host of this, the Jill on Money podcast. I'm here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Recently, Marcus personal loans were rated number one for personal loan customer satisfaction by J.D. Power. How did they get that number one rating? Because they put customers first. With a Marcus personal loan, you can choose your loan amount, your monthly payment, and payment date. Also, there are no fees. That means no worrying about late fees or sign-up fees. Even better, their loan specialists are available to help you on the phone. If you're looking to consolidate high-interest debt, pay off credit cards, or make a major purchase, check out Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Go to marcus.com forward slash Jill. You can money. For J.D. Power 2019 award information, go to jdpower.com slash awards. And now back to our interview with Cameron Huddleston. And you also say that, you know, obviously life events, but talking about your own financial planning experience, how would that express like if we were having a conversation? So I'm your mother. So start the conversation. Let's do this. Mock. So mom, my husband and I recently met with an attorney so that we could have a will drafted and name a power of attorney and have a living will drafted. I just didn't realize how important these documents were, you know, and I want you to know that we did this because I want you to know we have these documents and we've put them in the, you know, in our home safe. And so if something happens to us, 
you know where to find them. Have you and Dad done this? Do you have these documents? Can you tell me where to find them? If oh, something yeah, we happens have them. You? The lawyer has them. The lawyer has them. Okay, well, can you give me the name of your attorney? Oh, uh, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. Do I don't want to do this right now. I don't want to okay. talk about this. Okay, that's fine. Then you know what? I'm going to send you an email and remind you. And then you can just tell me the name of your attorney and where those documents are in case I need them. So the reason why I put that out there is that I think that sometimes these conversations, you're perfectly willing to go there, but either one of you have a hard time really thinking about what this conversation is about, which is now I'm talking about my death. And that's hard. And what you did is kind of brilliant. Like you back right off and you say, don't push this. Don't push it. Because that's bad. That's going to lead to a, an unhappy outcome for both. Let's say you send the email. I don't respond. You want to bring it up again? Like how long do you want to wait? Because now this is like, now I presume as the child, you're like, uh-oh, where are these? Are these documents real? Is mom, you know, blowing smoke? It's so it's hard to know. Gently remind them. Again, you know, when you happen to be on the phone or visiting mom, oh, yeah, mom, did you get that email that I sent? You know, I don't I don't want to sound like I'm nagging here. I just want to make sure that you have these things in place. And then maybe you use another story, another story about things that did not go well for a friend whose parents didn't have these documents or they couldn't find them. Like you said, and like I said, don't push too hard, but don't give up either. When do you have to give up for real? Like, I mean, there are people I know. I remember I was um, I was on vacation and someone found out what I did for a living. And they were telling me about their in-laws who were really resistant. And I said, did you try this? Did you try this? Yes, 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 yes. And she said, first of all, it's my husband's parents. So, like, I don't want to push too hard. And he doesn't want to damage his relationship. He's really concerned. Just so happens the guy was a rabbi. And the father was a rabbi. So there's like a lot of like anxiety in this whole family in general and respect issues. And, you know, I am your elder kind of thing. I said to her, look, you can only do what you can do. So when do you think you pull back and just wait again? Or how do you help people navigate that? I agree that it does get to a point when there is only so much you can do. If you have tried a variety of approaches if you tried to maybe get a third party involved, mm-hmm. maybe a, a trusted family friend, a, a financial planner, an attorney, if you've tried and tried, and if you've made it very clear that you want to gather some information from your parents because there might come a point when they might need your help and they've still resisted, then you do have to step back and say, okay, they're not going to talk to me. And this is especially important if you see that they might be having financial issues going forward. You might have to either, A, start preparing your own finances to help them out if that is something that you can do because you don't want to jeopardize your own finances. But if it is, if you can set aside some money to help provide for their care or maybe you don't downsize because you know you're going to have to move mom and dad Mm -hmm. in with you, prepare your finances or prepare yourself emotionally for the fact that you might have to say when they come to you finally asking for help, You know, I I did try to have these conversations and there's only so much I can do. There's only so much my own finances will allow. I have my own family. I want to be able to help you, but there are limits. Before I let you go, I'm wondering, you know, you're a parent yourself. How might you want to have this conversation with your adult children? Because you still have kids, little kids. But like, let's pretend it's 15 years from now and your oldest is getting married. What kind of conversation do you want to have around money with your adult child? My kids have been subjected to money conversations as soon as they were old enough to talk. But as they get older, I'm going to let them know what my husband and I have done to plan for our older age. My plan, which I've already done, actually, I have, it sounds a little bit morbid, but I have an in case I die folder. Okay, that's very funny. I have a or folder. Or not a, a case, but when I die folder. Okay, I have I have a folder that's called in case I hit, I get hit by a bus. <laughs> it's That's exactly what it says. In case I get hit by a bus. Because it doesn't even have to be death. You could have something bad. Right. As you said, you could Disability. be in the hospital, mm-hmm. right? You could be in the hospital and you could like have had a terrible accident and you recover fully a month from now, but a lot of bad things can happen in a month. Okay, so you've got that folder, but I'm asking a slightly different question. How much should parents of adult children sniff around to make sure that their kids are doing what they need to do? I honestly think that you don't have to tread quite so lightly. I would not hesitate to tell my kids they've gotten married. 
Okay, so you're married now. Do you have a life insurance policy? Have you met with an attorney to get a will? Because these things are important. You have someone who is relying on you financially. So you need to have these things in place. And I think as a parent, it is my role to educate my kids about these things. How else are they going to learn? My parents didn't teach me this. I learned this on the job as a personal finance journalist. And I'm so thankful that I did learn it. And so I have been trying to teach my kids these lessons from the time they were little. And so if they get older and I see that they're making mistakes, I'm going to step in and say something. And if they come to me and ask for money and they're already adults, I'm going to say, okay, well, why are you asking me for money? Let's figure out, let's, let's look at your budget. Let's see how you're spending money. I, I'm not going to hesitate to do that with my kids. I know plenty of parents. Well, I know plenty of parents give their kids tons of money. You know, there was one survey that found that Gen Xers and baby boomers are giving their adult children $500 billion a year in support. That's twice as much as they're saving for their own retirement. Oh, God. And I'm not going to do that. I am not going to jeopardize my own retirement and my own future to support my adult children. I will help them now that they are children and hopefully make them financially responsible adults. But if I if I am helping them at the jeopardy of my own finances, then they're going to have to take care of me. They're going to have to jeopardize their finances to support me as I get older. And I don't want to do that to them. I do not want to be a burden to my kids. It's great information. It is written in a very accessible way. And I thank you so much. So before we let you go, I asked you in the beginning, I said the best money or your career decision. You said becoming a financial journalist for both. What's the worst? Okay. So (laughs) my... My father passed away when he was 61. He had a heart attack. He was in a second marriage, and he died without a will. Aye. And he was an attorney, so he should have known better. Oh, dear. He had a life insurance policy, though, and my sister and I were beneficiaries, and so I got this windfall. I was 28 at the time, and if you ask me now what I did with that windfall, I'm not sure I could tell you. Just this kind was, of went this away. Was, this was before I became a financial journalist. And I, 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 I got money. Now, I probably used some of it for some student loan payments. My husband and I were moving, and so I probably used it to pay for some moving costs. But I blew it. I mean, I that could have given me such a great start. You know, put it into a Roth IRA or pay down all of my student loan debt. But I don't even know what I did with the money. Mm, just slip through your fingers. Oh, I hope gosh. you had fun. I don't, I don't even know if I had one. <laughs> You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for our new feature. It's called the Marcus Minute, presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Today, in the hot seat, Cameron Huddleston, author of Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk. You ready? I'm ready. Get the clock starting, Mark. What's one word to describe your relationship with money? Healthy. What's always worth spending on? Healthcare. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a tough one. The dumbest thing. Oh, man. Uh, an overpriced piece of clothing that I didn't even wear that often. Whose face would you put on the dollar bill? I don't know. I think it's fine just the way it is. <laughs> How much do you spend on a haircut? I get my hair cut and colored all at once, and it's about $100. It's your last day on earth. You got 100 bucks in your pocket. What would you do with it? I would go have a really awesome dinner at a nice restaurant, but it would probably only cover my meal because if it's a really nice restaurant, it's going to be pretty expensive. Cameron Huddleston, the book is called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk, How to Have Essential Conversations with Your Parents About Their Finances. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much to Cameron Huddleston. Her book is called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk. We drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday, and sometimes we sneak a little bonus in there at the end of the week. If you'd like to join us, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, you can go to our website, JillOnMoney.com. We've got links to wherever you want to go. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio is our executive producer. We're distributed by Cadence 13. And our show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See you next week.